My name is Vicki, and I'm a member here at Desert Grace Community Church. We have a great message for you today, and if you've enjoyed this video, be sure to give us a thumbs up and leave a comment so we can know you've been blessed. Have a good day. Week one was hope, and if you haven't been around, I've been talking about the presence of God bringing the things that are represented really in the Advent candle. And we talked a little bit about the book of Exodus, and when the Israelites were sort of stuck in Egypt, and God comes down and speaks to Moses out of a burning bush, and brings that sort of hope, the presence of hope. Last week was love. And we talked a little bit about a verse that I think is a, a passage that is one verse is part of, but we should pay attention to the whole passage, about how Jesus, God lo so loved the world that he sends his only son to die that we might be saved, but also he did not send him into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. And so that love brings salvation. So if you've been keeping track, that's hope, that's love. This week is the joy candle, the pink one. And I started to wonder, what do most people think of when they think of the word joy? So I tried to sort of look it up and see if there was sort of the popular definition of the word joy. And generally, most people kind of equate joy with happiness. And I, w I began to wonder, you know, joy is so much more than happiness. Merriam-Webster describes it as this. It's the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or that you have the prospect of one of those things. And so it doesn't really necessarily describe, I guess, a, a happiness point of view. But it does seem to describe something in which we are just finding ourselves where we want to be or where we think we ought to be in life. And I'm just a little bit worried about that. Because too often, the idea of feeling joy is so dependent on the feeling of, of being happy. And I don't know if you've ever been around somebody who is happy all the time. <laughs> who even, in the midst of everything that's going wrong, still smiling. Like as though if everything was burning around them, they'd be like, well, hey... At least I'm not on fire. I'm convinced that most of us are dependent on things not being on fire and not dependent on, look at what God is doing in the midst of everything else that he's doing. You see, joy that is dependent on happiness is joy that is easily stolen. And I got to tell you, there's some people that I come into contact with that every so often I begin to wonder, like, you seem to have some incredibly great joy, but anything comes along and begins to zap it, to begin to t sort of take it away, to remove it, to change that joy into something else. So if we're looking at joy through being God's presence, we need to be looking at it from the right perspective. That God's presence doesn't necessarily only be present in the times that are good and happy. But my question for us this morning is this. What is the proper response to the blessing of God's presence? Now God is present. He's here in this room. You have brought him in. I've said that a few times over the last several weeks, and, and I want to make sure we get this. That if Jesus and, and the Spirit is living in you, that you are the one who brings him here. So, do you recognize that? Curious, if you were going to ask yourself a question this morning, which book most resembles joy to you, what would that book be? I don't think that there's any book that you would think of 
more than the book of Leviticus. Wasn't what you were thinking, I guess. Exodus is definitely a book of joy. If you know the story of the Exodus, and of course Leviticus sort of just continues that story, the Israelites have been out wandering and wandering and wandering. They're headed for the promised land. In the midst of this, God says, I'm going to tell you how to build a dwelling place for me. It was one of the first capital projects that was ever undertaken by a religious group. (laughs) And by the way, at one point in the midst of that whole thing, there were so many donations that the, 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 the director of the project had to say, Moses, will you please stop telling people to bring stuff over? Tell them we have more than enough. Sort of like it happens today, but not quite. So they had just completed the the tent of meeting. The tabernacle is another name for it. And, And now it's time for there to be some additional work being done. And that's why we find ourselves in the midst of Leviticus talking about joy, even though you had no clue there was any joy in the book of Leviticus. You see, the tabernacle was the dwelling place. It's the place where God's presence was supposed to be. That when Moses needed to speak to God, he can go in. And then now what we're going to see today is when Aaron finally gets to become the high priest for the Israelites and therefore comes into play and gets to sort of be ordained by Moses. At the time Moses, of, of Moses and Aaron... Access to God was only through the priests. You, as a regular Israelite, didn't go in because you were afraid. Now, if you don't know this already, a lot of times what would happen is you would end up with Moses, you know, hey, God is speaking from the mountain, and and the people saying things like, Moses, you go talk to God. Tell us what he says. We don't want to go. We don't want to hear what, you know, we're, we're afraid of what would happen. So God ends up being mediated that there's somebody that we go through to find out what God has to say about everything. And that's basically the role of the Levite priests. So here's where that begins. Moses commands Aaron and all of the Israelites, by the way, to gather sacrifices to be given in worship. So these are animals, and he gives some very specific instructions. So Aaron as he's about to be essentially ordained as a priest, has to be giving some sacrifices on his own account so that he would be pure and ready to become the priest for all of Israel. So he is told to bring a calf as a sin offering and bring a ram as a burnt offering. So he is to go gather these things and come to the area of the tent of meeting where the altar has been placed. Moses tells Aaron to go and tell the Israelites that they need to bring some things along too. The first thing that they are told to bring is a goat without defect as their sin offering. In this particular case, it's a goat. Aren't you excited? Woohoo! Some of you are like, you lost me already. They're also told that they're supposed to be a, bring a calf and a lamb, both one year old and both without blemish. They need to be perfect animals. These are going to be the burnt offering. So we have the sin offering and the burnt offering. Then the Israelites are told to bring an ox and a ram for a fellowship offering. And they're also supposed to bring a grain offering, which is grain mixed with olive oil. So here's what they are all supposed to bring. Now, Moses gives this command, and with the command comes a promise. And the promise is this, that the Lord will appear. Now, I'm going to make you a promise. 
that every Sunday we are going to worship. And if you will come to worship completely prepared to do your part of the worship service, the Lord will appear. And if you walk out today and say, man, God just wasn't there today. I've already felt him. I'm sorry if you haven't. You see, with worship comes the presence of God. It's basically what Moses is saying. So Aaron and the Israelites, they gather what they do. They gather at the altar near the tent of meeting. They're all ready to go, and Moses commands Aaron to begin. Now, I want to kind of set the stage for you because we have it kind of good here. I might preach a really long time, but if you wanted to watch me slaughter some animals, it would take me way longer. (laughs) And back in those times, as far as I can tell, based on history and archaeology, they did not have nice, soft, padded chairs. I figure these are rated for about three hours, and that's when you guys will stop listening. So Aaron begins his first sacrifice, the, the calf, as a sin offering for himself to purify himself to become the high priest. Now he has to slaughter the calf. It was living when this whole thing began, and everybody present is watching this happen, and it is an act of worship. He dips his finger in the blood, and he puts some on the horns of the altar, because this is what he's been instructed to do. And so, finally, he gets through some of that. He takes some of the choice parts. I'm not going to get too gross with you, but let's just say a kidney and a couple other things and some fatty parts are put on the altar and the others are taken away to be burned. So, I don't know how long that would take, but he gets done with the first one and the fire has been started and there's a nice little sizzle of fat probably. I'm not really sure because I wasn't there. Contrary to popular belief of my children, I was not there. He moves on to the burnt offering. This time he goes ahead and he takes care of the animal. He splashes blood on the sides of the altar and the entire animal is to be burned. So that's what he does. Again, I said that in a sentence or two. My guess is it took a little longer than what I said for it to have actually occurred, right? For the blood to have drained. For This is a long process of worship. Most of you would be sleeping by now in the process. Some of you already are, but that's a whole other story. So Aaron moves on to the sacrifices of the people, basically going through the exact same ritual as his own sacrifices. Only now, some of the cases, there were doubles. The portion of grain offering is added to the fire. The fellowship offering, the ox and the ram is is made. And this time, he had been instructed by Moses to wave some of the internal organs around before placing them on the fire as a wave offering to God. Are you sure you don't find joy in the book of Leviticus? (laughs) Here's the thing. During each of these sacrifices, the Israelites are acting primarily as spectators in the worship service. That it is at this point a spectator sport. If there were a hundred Israelites, but I'm sure there were way more, very few of them were involved in actually bringing the animals forward. They probably chose leaders and said, here are the best among our flock. And, and so now we're just sort of standing around. And as I've described it, some of you have been giving me those sort of bored looks. Imagine if I was standing here going through the process of a, of a sacrifice. Of course, you then want me to pay for therapy for you and all of that. And 
but they're simply spectators. There's no indication, perhaps there was, but there's no indication that there was a worship leader there who sang songs or that they were sorted prayers or whatever else. They simply were gathered around watching as Aaron goes through this long, drawn-out process. Hmm. Just how long and drawn out do you think it was? I'm trying to paint a picture here. I think it's important for us to understand that it would take a while for this ritual to happen. For Aaron to be able to find the right parts, for him to be able to drain the animals, for, for the next one to be brought forward. And, and meanwhile, while everybody else just sort of standing there watching, and maybe they are just super more excited than most of you are right now to hear me speak. It's those three-hour chairs. <laughs> How long do you think it would take to completely consume the pieces of a half a dozen animals? So, what would you think if... Uh, Moses and Aaron, well, Aaron gives you a quick blessing and then goes into the temple of meeting. I could tell you what would happen here if I went into the temple of meeting and said, hey, I gotta go talk to God for a minute and I'll be right back. I'd come back, this room would be empty. There'd be like five of you sitting here just kind of waiting to go. I didn't want to leave. So we get to our passage today. Leviticus chapter 9, verses 20 through, 22 through 24 says this, Then Aaron lifted his hands towards the people, and he blessed them. And having sacrificed the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the fellowship offering, he stepped down. Moses and Aaron then went into the tent of meeting, and when they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. Hmm. You see, the end of the service includes this blessing for Israel. And by the way, the blessing, the very end of the service, is what they had all stood there waiting for. You understand what I'm saying? Not just because it was the end, because God was going to appear. Do you remember? If you will do this, God will appear. And so we did what God told us to do. What are we waiting for now? We're waiting for God to appear. I know, I know, I know. This is such easy. Like, this is kindergarten for you guys. Because every Sunday, you walk in here, you're like, if we do what we're going to do, God is going to appear by the end of the service. And that's the whole purpose for being here. By the way, that's true. You just don't seem to realize it all the time. Sometimes it's like, oh, that sermon was too long. Oh, that song, you know, someone was a little flat. Oh, the air was a little warm in here today. Oh, you know... Did you meet God? That's what you came for. Amen. So the scripture starts off. Aaron lifts his hands towards his people. He says, you guys are blessed. I don't know exactly what he says. He, he, nobody says exactly the words that he uses, but he blesses all of Israel right there, now having gone through the ritual, the worship that he was supposed to do, the sacrifices that he makes. And you would think that that would be the end of the event. Wouldn't you? Like, normally I've just sort of noticed that when Tawny says, well, thank you so much for being here, you are dismissed. Most people don't wait for her to say it twice. <laughs> I've never had a single person say, I'm going to stay until I feel blessed by God. It's never happened. But in this case, the sacrifices were complete, but the event wasn't quite through. Why did all the people wait? Well, I'm pretty well convinced at this point that it's because they were waiting for God to appear. 
So Aaron and Moses go into the tent of meeting, and I don't know if everyone was standing around staring, just waiting for God to come out with them, or what to expect. Scholars debate on what they did when they were in the tent of meeting, because as we read the scripture, you saw how detailed it was, right? Aaron and Moses, they go into the tent of meeting, and then they come out, right? So scholars are thinking, all right, well, maybe they went in just to have a conversation with God. Have you ever really needed to talk to God and you, you found a place where you feel like you can meet with God? And just go in and just be? To just sit and, and listen to what God might say to you? Have, has that ever been the case for you? There's a chance that Moses says this is really Aaron's ordination day. He's now a priest. In case you didn't catch it, this is the first time he gets to go into the holy, the holy place, the tent of meeting. So perhaps he's getting a tour. And Moses is saying, look, here's this, here's that. Check this out. This is the, the incense, and this is, the, you know, this is what you do. And here's how you will go about approaching God. This is how you, you begin to do. We know that this is Aaron's first time to actually be able to go into the tent and to experience God's presence firsthand the way Moses had been doing. And by the way, I think the way we should be doing now, but that's a whole side story. It's a different sermon, and you already laughed at me when I said these were three-hour chairs. What we do know is that inside the tent of meeting, Moses and Aaron would have been blessed by God's presence. I want to kind of throw something out here. If God ever makes his presence known to you, is it a blessing? Most of you seem to think yes. Some of you are like, it hasn't happened to me yet, and I'm not so sure whether I would be excited and whether it'd be a blessing or whether I'd be fearful. Even if you were fearful in the moment, afterwards would you not be blessed? When the angels all appear to whoever they happen to appear of in the Christmas story, what is the first thing they say? Do not be afraid. So there's something about God's presence that tends to make us a little bit afraid. But afterwards, there's a blessing. Whatever happened inside that that tent of meeting, God's presence, God himself was with them. And there's no chance that they didn't get blessed while they were in there because guess who else was in the tent? Yahweh himself. So the scripture doesn't expressly say this. It leaves out a lot of details. But my guess is they walk out feeling a little bit joyful. We just went and talked with God. Oh my goodness, this is so awesome. And, and we were in God's presence. And when you're in God's presence, guess what happens? It doesn't matter what else is happening. There's joy. Amen. So Moses and Aaron, they come out. They exit the tent of meeting. And what do they do? They see all the people standing there and they go, you are so blessed. A second time, they give a blessing. It wasn't just a one and done. They go inside, they come out, and they're like, oh, good, you waited. Because guess what? We just met with God, and I'm just overcome. Bless you again. I notice that when you read through the Scripture, again, not a lot of detail, but they don't seem to be very surprised that everybody was waiting. After all, if you do the worship, God will appear. God hadn't yet appeared the way we might have think about it. But they come out, they find everybody standing there, and and this is an important thing. I want you to hear this really well. Blessed people will bless people. If God gets into your heart, and if you've been in the presence of God, it is difficult to walk away from that experience and not bless somebody else. 
So God makes his glory and presence known with a special fire. I mentioned already that probably this has been burning for a long time now, and, and it would be a normal, everyday sort of burning. And then all of a sudden, Moses and Aaron come out, and they bless the people again. And this time, it says that it came from the presence of the Lord. I don't know whether that's from the altar or whether it like flew out of the tent. I don't know where it came from because it doesn't really describe it. But that it is such an amazing fire that it immediately consumes everything that was left. Now, I've mentioned this before. Moses, when there's a fire in a bush, I'm pretty sure where there's fire, there is heat. Imagine the flash of heat. All of the sacrifices are instantly consumed. There is no question that this is the glory of Yahweh. That they had done their part, and God now had done his. Now, this passage, you know, it, it says all of Israel was filled with joy. All of Israel was filled with joy. All fell and, and worship at the presence of the Lord. Because if God is going to show his face, what we don't want is to simply be looking back going, well, that's cool. We want to immediately take a, a position of worship. And by the way, I think most of us would have acted like all of Israel and would have immediately fallen and said, Lord, you are so great. I think we'd have been filled with joy. I think if you have ever been in one of those services like this one where the preacher's really going, he's on a roll, and you are just feeling blessed... Five of you. <laughs> that when you leave this place, you are excited about your day. You feel joy, no matter what else has been going on in your world. That's where they're at. What's the proper response to the blessing of God's presence? It's a question I asked you at the beginning. I have a little bit of an issue here. Because I'm, I'm sort of convinced that more and more God shows us his glory and we're not paying attention. That in a very real sense, we have come to this place out of a rote memory, out of a, out of a this is what I do on Sunday morning. And in so doing, what ends up happening is that we haven't really done our part, and so the presence of God showing up and really impacting us doesn't happen. You see, if we've done our part, isn't God going to do his? Aren't there times when God shows his glory all around us? It doesn't have to be here, but that God will show you his glory. Do you see some of the beautiful weather we experience here in Yuma? I know, I know, I know. It got really cold. It's like going to be 60. High 30s at night. We might freeze. The sun comes up, and it's beautiful. You wake up, and do you know who put that air in your lungs? It was God. Amen. He shows up every day. He keeps you breathing. Amen. And i got to admit that sometimes I get in to be in such a hurry, I kind of forget. Look at that gorgeous scene over there. Yep, but I got to go somewhere. The proper response to the blessing of God's presence is overflowing joy. Now notice I didn't say joy. 
I said overflowing joy. When you see God, if you were to leave this place because you have now been in worship and God wants to show himself to you, if God fills you with his presence and you have felt the presence of God and you are having a wonderful day, it is going to be really hard for you to go wherever you go next, even if it's to home and the cat is being ornery. I said cat because cats are of the devil and dogs are God's creatures and would never be ornery. But you go home and the dog or the cat has done something on the floor that the dog or cat is not supposed to do on the floor. If you've been with God, this is the one day where you're like, oh, you're one of God's creatures. If you've been here all day listening to my voice drone on and on, just waiting for a a merciful end, and you go home and that same animal has done that same thing, and you have not encountered God, you're going to have a hard time keeping your foot on the floor. I got to tell you, I mean, I'm trying to be a little funny with the animal, I think. But my guess is most of you are going to see people. You going out to eat after this? What's going to overflow on the people around you? Joy? Oh my gosh, I've been at church. I met with God this morning. I'm having a great day. Here's your tip, and it's more than a dollar. been a bad day nothing's going to taste right you see when we find ourselves recognizing god's unquestionable presence we are going to be overfilled overcome with joy it's going to be the reality it isn't about being happy or about being sad. It's, it's that in the middle of everything else that's going on, and I know that all of us have somebody in our life or something going on in our own lives that is really beginning to weigh on us, and yet there can still be joy. Why? Because when you show up to worship as God has asked you to, He will show up to, He will be present. So God promised us during Advent season. It's the week we celebrate joy. Why is there joy? Because God is present. In the worst moments of life, God's presence can still bring overwhelming joy. That doesn't mean happiness. It means joy. It's this whole thing of hope, love, joy. And then next week we'll talk about peace. It's everything. Christmas, for some of you, brings good emotions. For some of you, it's going to bring bad emotions. Some of you have great memories of Christmas. Some of you, maybe not so much. But either way, you should have joy. Why? Because God has come down from heaven, and he came to earth as a little baby. Isn't this good news? So we're now in week three of the Christmas season, the Advent season. Has it been a season of joy for you yet? Have you looked around and have you noticed that God's presence is all around you? Or are you struggling on that front? The second thing that I would say is the proper response to blessing of God's presence is authentic worship. This might sound a little weird, If you come prepared the way you're supposed to be prepared, you are going to encounter God while you're here at the church. And when you encounter God here at the church, the thing that you are going to most want to do is worship God more. You see, I've been challenging people to not just worship God while they're in this room, but to be so filled with joy that when you leave this place that you are overflowing with it. 
but you have so much of God's presence that you have to give some of it away. You can't contain it. The only way to do that is to keep wanting to worship God more. You don't have to wait for Sundays. Did you know that? You can worship God on Sunday afternoon. Well, if you're not watching football. No, you can, you can Sunday afternoon. Before you go to bed, first thing in the morning, during breakfast, you can sing praises in the shower. You see, it's about this wanting to keep having God in your life. The Israels shouted for joy. They fell with their faces to ground because God was present. Now, what I don't think the scripture tells you is that a lot of those people were probably crying tears of joy. I tend to be more sophisticated than to allow my emotions to overcome. (laughs) But occasionally, I am so filled with joy that the tears just begin to flow. Some people, when they are absolutely joyful, might have joyful laughter. You've heard these people, right? And when they begin to laugh, everyone around them begins to laugh too because the the overcoming presence of joy is contagious. But the glory of God's presence really brought around the worship they had not seen all day. It was a two-sided worship. Did you catch that? They'd been spectators the entire time. And now God's presence shows up. They are seeing God for their own selves. And now it's a two-way street. God is present. He's present for them. He's present for you. He's in this room right now. If you're not connected with him, let's talk later. I'd love for you to be able to connect with God. But my question would be, how are you worshiping? If you came in here this morning hoping for a good show, we'll give you your money back on the way out. That's not what this is all about. We'll refund your ticket price. See Karen. (laughs) Email vicky at (laughs) desertgrace.org. Hope leads to love. Love leads to joy. Jesus comes and he's going to come again is your joy bringing you worship or is your worship bringing you joy or is your worship bringing God's presence had a hard time with how to close this question because there are so many things I wanted to put here there are so many things that, that when you are, are presented with God, the thing that I would hope you're getting out of this is that the very first reaction is that you, you worship and have joy. Because God is truly present. But in the end, that's up to you. This has been an empty time for you that I'm not getting this hour and a half back. Just remember, I told you I could go for three. (laughs) And I could, but you all told me you couldn't. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Not because we talked about sacrifices and sort of the gore and what that would look like, but because within that story, we see that if we would do what we are supposed to do, that we would bring everything that we have and that we would bring our worship to you as though it's the most important thing of the day. That in the end, your promise is that you will be present. That you are going to be with us. That you are going to make yourself known to each one of us. So my prayer right now is that if there's somebody in this listening to the sound of my voice, just not feeling you. 
that you would just absolutely infuse them with your presence. You would just make your, your presence known to them in ways that perhaps they've never experienced before. Lord, we recognize that we need a Savior and that you have sent Jesus to be that Savior. Let us never forget that we walk in your presence each and every day and our response, no matter what, should be joy. But Lord, in that joy, may we always remember you are worthy to be worshipped. And that if we would simply look for you and recognize your presence, the joy would always be at the tip of our fingertips. That we would find ourselves being joyful people, the kind that maybe even are a little annoying to those who live in a dark world. And so, Lord, speak to us. Guide us this week. Show us your presence. Fill us with your joy. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said amen. Thanks for watching this message with me. If you want to see more, make sure you hit that subscribe button and bell to be notified when we go live or post a new video. We'd also like to invite you to join us at a live service here at Desert Grace. For more information, visit desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928-305-1132 for more information. Thank you.